my goal here today is really to take you through the journey that it's been for us to go through this with this project uh, from kind of like a, a small project to a whole, you know, full blown company uh, and, and try to give you a sense of, you know, what, what are the, the, the problems on the way and, and hopefully uh, at some of these steps we can, we can stop together and, and, and discuss uh, how other members in these conversations can, can possibly have uh, went through similar uh, kind of problems and how they solved it and, uh, and together get a better sense of uh, how we can make open source technologies uh, for health and well-being more accessible and, and uh, easier to, to build and, and deploy um, and, uh, and maximize adoption. So quickly, uh, yeah, I don't think there's much time to go. Uh, we don't have to go into details about this, but there's currently uh, a global mental health crisis. I think the, uh, the global health uh, students will be, you know, maybe better than me uh, or better, better than me to, ex to explain this thing, but you know, there's a major problem in terms of depression, um, anxiety, I think, you know, just to, just to take the example of France itself, so it's not global, but just if we take France, I think that there is 25% of the worker during the pandemic that uh, went through, uh, that reported severe anxiety. Um, and uh, I have some of the numbers here. Uh, uh, in the US, there's a uh, 70% of the population oui. that uh, suffers from mild uh, PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. Ah. Uh, si je... Yes, so, uh, yeah, we have one third of the population that's you know, depressed, uh, anxiety also, uh, isolation and loneliness, um, and, uh, you know, internet addiction. I think this number is largely underestimated and... Uh, you're doing a podcast, I think a very interesting podcast to look into uh, the side effects of technology. Maybe you already know it. It's called Your Undivided Attention uh, by Tristan Harris from the Center for Humane Technology, um, who's doing a really good job at showing all of the side effects that technology as we know it today, uh, that is technology that is addictive by design and where the, uh, the, the economic model of the people who own the technology revolves around, uh, you know, attention um, uh, of users very much in the same way that, you know, TV uh, functioned in terms of uh, attention uh, and, and paying for attention to, to, to sell things to people. Uh, they're doing a really good job at explaining the side effects of, of this, especially on millennials. So I was listening to a talk by Jonathan Haidt the other day, for example, uh, on the how you know, suicide in, 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 in young, uh, adults, uh, you know, exploded after the introduction of the like button, for example. And um, it's really interesting uh, and, 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 you know, devastating some of the side effects that this widespread use uh, of technology may have. And, and I'm trying to, to change that a bit through uh, this technology that I, that, I, that I will tell you about today in trying to rethink uh, actually the, our relationship to computers. And so I'll try to say a few words about this. And so in terms of um, uh, uh, markets, uh, because that's something that interests like investors, um, I, I'm also presenting these figures here uh, to give you a sense of how somebody who would want to fund the project would look at this. Um, they, they represent like a huge market. So you have a lot of corporate interest into these things and, and wellness is, and, 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 and mental health is starting to be sort of like a strategy for a lot of investment uh, funds. Um, so the current solutions that we have today are, uh, you know, can be put into three general categories. So you have therapy, uh, and the most widespread form of therapy is cognitive and behavioral therapy that has a huge high, you know, a huge drop rate. Um, and has the main problem with therapy is that, first of all, it's very expensive, uh, and it's really hard to find the right person. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever went through therapy, but it's, it's really hard. And, and it's really hard to, to track your progress over time, right? You don't know whether you're doing it right or not. Uh, another solution to, to the problem of mental health and the mental health crisis is Indian pharmaceuticals, um, where uh, that, you know, with the effects and the side effects that, that we know. And the third is the apps and device world, uh, which still has like a very high drop rate. So people, you know, buy the Apple Watch and then they will use it once or twice, but then Ultimately, it will just be a fancy gadget to show that they have a lot of money. Um, and, and we're losing this human touch of healing with, with these devices that, uh, 
you know, end up sort of like enhancing some of the side effects that the known technology has. Um, and there are also like, you know, these big problems of, you know, you know, the apps proposed, for example, autism spectrum disorders are really evidence-based. Uh, Aniot has conducted very large uh, surveys of all the ex existing technology. So maybe he will be able to tell uh, a little bit more about this, but it's, it's you know, uh, it's oftentimes uh, just uh, marketing and there's not much science behind it. There's a huge privacy concern. Like I don't necessarily want Google and Google Health to have my data um, and, uh, and it's pretty boring. I mean, that's, that's a personal statement, but uh, I think there's huge improvement that can be made in terms of uh, our computers and our interface for dialoguing with our computers. And, uh, and I think the Apple Watch is you know, utterly boring and we could make it much more fun. Um, okay, so this um, sort of interest in mental health is also um, uh, you know, preceded or accompanied or paralleled by big changes uh, at the level of the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, which is going from a more categorical psychiatry where you put people into boxes depending on some symptoms that they may have. So you have you know, checkbook, this is the uh, classical or standard uh, you know, approach of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the DSM, where you, know, you put people into these this, this boxes depending on whether or not they have specific symptoms. So going from a categorical psychiatry like this to a more uh, dimensional psychiatry where um, you know, people will uh, be described in terms of their profiles and uh, the sort of the uniqueness of each uh, individual uh, phenotype is uh, taken into account in the, the treatments that they're, they're being given. And so here are some of these dimensions that are included in the uh, so-called research domain criteria, RDOC, from the National Institute of Mental Health. So here again, Anirut, I think, will complement this. And Anirut has been working on you know, building the software that can actually take this into account and, and move away from this you know, uh, you know, ticking box um, of psychiatry to a more you know, individualized, personalized, um, and, uh, and, and more precise psychiatry. So you can see that it ranges from you know, molecular biology and the level of genes all the way to actually, so it doesn't show here, but all the way to the social level and the community level. So uh, this may not be the best uh, diagram to express this, but the idea is that uh, they want you know, uh, health and mental health and well-being at every level in this multi-scale hierarchy of things where you have genes in molecules and cells and circuits um, and uh, physiology, behavior, and ultimately like subjective feelings, which can be uh, self-reported. And they have these various domains, which they look at, and you can see that this is what I mentioned. They have like a social domain, which is kind of like a novel thing uh, that, that I, I think is really interesting. And um, this is an initiative that uh, we are, we're building with some colleague at uh, McGill Psychiatry, trying to rethink how uh, psychiatry could be done. And I'm talking here psychiatry as a science or as a medical uh, science can, can, can be done a little bit differently by putting all the data, um, sharing the data, sharing the protocols, sharing the methods, sharing the results, sharing the modes of publication, um, and, uh, and ultimately like, you know, accelerating the, uh, the, 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 the process from idea to actual uh, you know, therapy that can be implemented for people. Um, so this, uh, sorry, we can't see much here. Let me see. So in addition to these sort of like institutional changes, there are also some scientific changes in how we understand uh, health and, and, and the body and mind. Um, and um, this, you know, human perception is usually, you know, divided into two streams. Uh, the first one being the exteroceptive stream, which we know the best. So this is how you uh, understand things about the external world, how your brain builds a model of the external world. And the interoceptive stream, which is how your brain has a sense of your bodily sensations and ultimately your homeostatic variables that keep you alive. So um, human perception is really divided into to these two, two, two streams. And so far we've really you know, been looking at exteroception. So the, you know, the very basic model for neuroscience today is vision, 
We know a lot of things about human vision and also rodent's vision. Uh, and for a long time, because of historical you know, dichotomies between brain and body or mind and matter, uh, we sort of let aside the role of the body in, in mental health and emotion and well-being or just in, in general in, in cognitive processes. But it turns out that actually the, uh, the body plays a major role in shaping our conscious experience of the external world. Um, and much of what we perceive about the external world is actually mediated about our own perception of the internal world, the so-called interception. And uh, that's, you know, it, that has led in psychiatry to model of psychiatric symptoms uh, that ultimately can be understood just in terms of interoceptive dysfunctions. And so that is to say, like, for example, if you think about anxiety in time of COVID, a lot of people, uh, for a lot of people, the anxiety is around, you know, breathing disorders, for example. Uh, or we talked about asthma before. Um, and that this is two very different, uh, you know, questions, but in general, anxiety or, you know, mental health disorders manifest themselves as interoceptive dysfunctions, where, for example, in terms of panic attacks, you know, they will manifest themselves as tachycardia or your, your heart rate suddenly accelerating, uh, or maybe, you know, you know, sedation or, or, uh, or, or, you know, thermoregulatory, uh, anomalies um, and a lot of you know psychiatric symptoms ultimately boils down to interoceptive dysfunctions and in very much the same way that our perception of the external world is mediated by models internal models that predict the behavior of external objects you know our understanding of our body is also a process of prediction where we're trying to uh, anticipate the uh, most likely causes of change in at the sense organ. So we're trying to anticipate, oh, you know, I'm feeling pain in my stomach. Uh, probably I must be scared or I must be stressed. And, and this is all a process of prediction that can be described mathematically. And, and, and there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, progress in terms of how this kind of, you know, calculation or computation could take place in terms of the uh, brain circuits that underline. But fundamentally, you know, interoception is this, this sense of uh, monitoring uh, basically how well you're doing at life. Um, and it relates fundamentally to one crucial element of life, which is action uh, through so-called homeostatic variables or homeostatic uh, um, uh, uh, inputs, uh, uh, which are things like, you know, temperature, respiration, sleep, um, uh, you know, also uh, things like, you know, breathing uh, uh, or, um, uh, uh, you know, cardiovascular activity, all of these things are predicted based on a model of how you're feeling right now. And they play a major role in um, altering your mood and affective states, uh, you know, and, and that in turn has effects on how you perceive the world. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm working on this company, uh, which we call Excel, uh, to try to uh, build, you know, so-called so social and creative biofeedback solutions for you know, doing this kind of interoceptive training and helping you know, people get better at uh, predicting their internal signals. Um, and we're trying to rethink how this technology is designed. And, and we have this notion of 6S, where we're trying to make it simple, social, uh, silent in the sense that you don't necessarily have to pay attention to it, uh, self-revealing in the sense that the first time you use it, you immediately get a sense of how it works, and soft uh, and, and screenless. Um, so the first example of, of what we do is a project we've been working on with uh, Clément, um, which we called X1, like the former name was Fuga. Uh, you can see some of the videos of this technology in action here. It's a uh, wearable technology that uh, functions with a set of sensors that transform immune gestures into sound. And, uh, and that allows you to sort of, uh, let's see, can I, if I go back here, that you know takes some like a, some uh, interoceptive, so it's not properly speaking interoceptive; it's more proprioceptive. So that has to do with your perception of the body in space, uh, which is kind of like a third route in between the two, because it informs you both about your internal perception and your perception of the external world. Um, but it's taking proprioceptive input and transforming it into sound, so into exteroceptive uh, uh, input for 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 your auditory cortex. And this way. You can actually access higher order levels and, and, and try to help the patients with his perception of reality. Um, so it's a project that started you know, with theater um, in Germany, a theater called Kampnagel and, uh, and, and, and a group of dancers from Ivory Coast. 
So from the onset, the uh, the technology was thought in a completely transcultural uh, context, where um, we had you know dancers that know very little about technology, um, and and frankly don't really care. I mean, they're interested in the effects, but not so much in the underlying electronics, right? Uh, we had we were working with them to try to design the system that could easily be implemented into this you know theater play uh, and, and produce the effects that we wanted. And they were like a very strict deadline in time. So you know in three weeks we had to come up with the technology that worked and it had to be shown in front of people. Um, we uh, so you can see on the Instagram uh, some of the videos of the technology in action. So. This kind of technology that really makes sense in terms of when you try them. I mean, seeing uh, seeing seeing them in a video, it, it doesn't really you know give you a, a full blown sense of, of how they work and what they do. But uh, and you know after this first show at the Camp Nagel, uh, it took about a year before we actually also um, started showing the the technology at Ars Electronica. Uh, we one of the major artists uh, in in the world of you know cyborg today called Moon Ribas. Um, and it was an active collaboration with um, uh, the Center for Research in Interdisciplinarity, where uh, I worked on at the time in, in Paris. Uh, we made all of the code available on GitHub, and most of the technology used so far is, is open source. And um, so to be completely transparent, and, and, and I think also and, uh, create some kind of discussion, I mean, Today, I, I'm sort of engaging discussions with venture capital firms to, uh, to get you know, further funds to, to, to build the project. And, and ultimately, we're running into this problem that they want to patent everything. So um, I don't know. Maybe now is some like a good time to to make a, a stop and and ask some of the other uh, open hardware project like uh, how they relate to this kind of like uh, origins question, like the, the first uh, and and how you move from something in the beginning that's uh, made for a very particular function all the way to some kind of a product that people could actually use or that could help patients on an everyday basis. Uh, and also this question of, uh, I think, IP and, and uh, patenting and, and how do you deal with, uh, you, know, you know, finding funding um, when um, you're neither really doing research because you want to help people. And I think there's a lot of problem with research where a lot of the amazing research that's being done in the labs usually never leave the lab and, and end up, you know, dying without anybody using them um or using it uh and and at the same time you know without falling into the trap of having like uh proprietary data sets or technologies that uh, can be only useful to very few people that have enough money to afford them uh and also you know like slowing down the, the, the rate of, of progress um because not everybody can add little improvements there you know i would say that i really got a sense of how open source technology can can be amazing for for this kind of projects when during the Ars Electronica show, uh, I was working with an engineer there uh, who was doing the visual. So when the uh, the dancer was moving around, um, it was also mod the sound was modulating uh, visuals that were shown on a dome. Um, and uh, you know, we wanted you know basically the technology worked with two effects. The first one is um, when you move, it modulates uh, the the volume. So the more you move and the faster you move, the more sound it makes. And the second one is like it will detect very sudden acceleration. So if you kick like really hard, it will trigger a sound. And we wanted to create an effect where when the dancer kicks, it creates thunder, and that thunder uh, creates you know visuals of thunder on the dome. Uh, but we didn't have the technology to do this, and very simply in a few lines of code, because everything was open source, uh, we were able to implement the uh, the code that allowed us to uh, control also visuals. Um, and, and I mean, you know, we did in a few you know, minutes what could have taken us a year if we were working on patented technology. So, so that, that gives like a really uh, good you know, explanation of why it's so important and so interesting to, to, to have open source technology, I think. And, you know, the funny thing is that the only two people who know about that are me and this engineer. I mean, the rest of the people, they just, you know, took it for, uh, uh, you know, uh, okay, like they just, you know, it's, it's normal. Like they, they, but actually, like, that's, that's, I think, an amazing uh, opportunity. That opportunity. So I don't know, maybe some of the other people um, in, in open hardware uh, projects, they want to say a few words about their own origins project uh, pro, or, or their own origin story and, and some of their challenges in trying to finding funds. When you're doing open source technology, maybe Clément or Fabio or Emmanuel. 
Okay, I'll count to seven. I, I, I wish to show the other day saying that when you ask something like this, in, in, you, you should count to seven. Uh, but just, uh, yeah, just in, in two words, like, uh, I think it's also a, a challenge. So for now, we have uh, tried to get funding from uh, public funds, from research, uh, from foundation. And one option is, is to do some sort of uh, crowdsourcing. Mm. So no, no VC, mm. because I think it's uh, it's really a different mindset, and I, I am not sure it's possible to find a way with them. Yeah, that's uh, that. So cross crowd, crowd uh, funding is, is an opportunity for sure, and there's a lot of stuff around also um, micro equity where uh, people who invest in in the company can get uh, you know very small shares, uh, allowing them to, to keep it. But yeah, there's a real question whether there can ever be any dialogue with the VC. I mean, yeah, and it's, it's likely that it's actually impossible. I mean, I'm, I'm right now going through the process of trying to find a middle way, uh, but I'm, I'm not too optimistic about it. I think it, the, it, it resolves around the, um, the question of demonstrating clearly the advantages of open source technology in terms of uh, you know, what VCs are interested in and their strategy. Okay, so here's a video of the technology. Um, I don't think you're gonna hear the sound from my computer, but let's try. There's not much point. So can you hear the sound? Yes? Is it, is it good quality or is it coming from my computer? Is it coming from the video or the computer? So just to give you some context here, the dancer is wearing the uh, devices at the wrist and ankles. And this is a dancer for the Prige Locage Ballet, one of the main ballets in, in, in the world today. And this is my studio in Paris where I, I build uh, the... That's the former name. Okay, so you get a sense. Of, there's much more, much more videos uh, on the Instagram if you're interested. So, okay, I'll go quickly on this. Um, this is kind of the uh, underlying uh, models behind that. I, I mean, we're not going to get details. So the idea is that you know the technology can also interact with a lot of different uh, you know sectors and fields. We can work with dance schools. You know, education, fitness, kids, neuroscience, uh, mental health, wellness, and the idea is really to because we're rethinking our interactions with you know computers. You know, it has effects wherever you, you find computers. So we did a first bunch of uh, studies uh, showing that um, we can actually uh, enhance you know body awareness. Uh, you know, people, the dancers are more satisfied with the performance when they dance with the technology. Uh, they have more pleasure dancing. They find it more immersive, and it increases the uh, the embodiment. And there's some interesting uh, effects in terms of the the dance level. Like, interestingly, the technology works best with expert dancers and complete novice, rather than people who are you know in the process of learning how to dance, because they have to unlearn a lot of things. Um, so this is, I think, you know, that that's our uh, our, our timeline for uh, like the next six months to give you a sense of how we sort of understand things. Uh, so the very you know, preliminary um, uh, things to do is to get a functional prototype. And it's, that's not such an easy thing to find, but we like getting a first prototype, obtaining some results like the one I just showed you and, and building some collaborations. Uh, and ultimately in like um, six months, we wanna be able to, uh, to move to, uh, having like open, uh, like some kind of lab in Paris where people can come and try the technology and, and build on it. Uh, and this is really annoying. Let's see if I do this maybe, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, and then, you know, getting some collaborations. So building collaborations is, is an important element of it. I think Clement will be talking more about this uh, this evening. But for example, we are collaborating actively with Clement in terms of, um, uh, psychogenic uh, epileptic seizures, 
uh, trying to use the device for healing trauma and releasing emotions or enhancing emotion uh, expression uh, and helping people who may have difficulty expressing their emotions um, to, to like alexithymia patients, for example. And yeah, ultimately, like also moving to, uh, to a stage of manufacturing, uh, obtaining the certification, it's, it's a big uh, pain, um, and, 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 and working on the design that really fits um, you know, the end users um, to ultimately being able to, to print uh, you know, something like 5,000 kits, for example, in, in the factory. Um, so we're doing this by collaborating with a lot of people. Uh, I mentioned the Camp Nagel Theater, the Ars Electronica, uh, MIT Media Lab, where I'm a uh, researcher, uh, and specifically the Fluid Interfaces Group. Um, we went to the uh, startup school at White Combinator, which is a good exercise, and I would recommend because it gives you a sense of how these people think, uh, which is always like a good thing to know. Uh, and of course, the Cree and Inserm, and, and currently like going through this, this program called Entrepreneur First. Uh, so programs of this sort can be really useful to help you find the co-founders, which are really critical. I mean, one thing that really slowed down the, 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 the project was the lack of co-founder and finding the right people to do the technology with is, is really important. Um, and, and building a network is nice, but uh, sometimes it can make you feel like you're making progress where in fact you're really not. And ultimately when you're doing a project like this, there are some very precise metrics that you wanna see grow, right? Like number of users, uh and you know like that that's not like so far i've had something like 50 people try fuga and ultimately we have to grow you know that number because uh, then you get a real sense of uh you know what your technology ends up doing for people uh and and there's a huge gap between what you imagine that this could do uh and what it actually does when you put it on people and so as fast as possible i would recommend prototyping and putting the prototype into the hands of real people and having them send that it, it, it's really not interesting for them because that's that's how you move towards like understanding their pain points and how you can actually uh, help them solve some of their problems um yeah so that's my contact so if you want to ask any question uh, feel free to do so uh i don't know if you have any question at this stage otherwise uh, i'd love to to you know give the ground to any so he can present some of his stuff I'll wait five seconds. No, just one thing important to me is you, you have an open approach, means a lot of partnership with medical institution, with artists, and, and it's it's interesting. And what you what you say was interesting. And what what one of the point is the open hardware point. Oh. And it's not it's not that easy. And, uh, I mean, uh, as a co-founder of an open hardware project, I know the hardware project is hard to fund. It's very it's very difficult. I mean, we can fund the AI parts, we can fund the the I mean the companion apps to help patients or the uh, the integration within the medical institution because it. We, with uh, institutions that help project, uh, that support projects, uh, rely the, I mean, which care about disabilities, for example, there are, there are some fundings, but for the hardware part, it's quite difficult, to my opinion, and that's that's a challenge for every project uh, like us. I mean, all these collaborations that we can fund with uh, with foundation, with uh, research project. Or we can bring it and bring this open this hardware part within the, the fundings. But we didn't succeed yet, so we are looking for every project we we support. We say, hey, look at this uh, hardware part. It's very important to contribute and to fund this because you have a lot of makers, a lot of engineers that bringing their time to improve it. But we, it's as it's not directly linked to the usage. It's more difficult. That's Absolutely. my uh, perspective, yeah. and I wish we could find a, a way to say. But you have to to be aware that it's directly linked. The more you you get uh, effort in the hardware part, the more the the tool that we'll be using will be efficient. Yeah, no, I absolutely uh, absolutely agree. Um, and uh, let, I. I would suggest uh, maybe keeping this discussion for the end so that Anirudh has some time. Um, but I absolutely agree. And I think there's we have to look into models that, that worked 
outside the realm of hardware and see what could make it work for hardware. And I think we really have to boil down what is needed for a hardware project to grow uh, and scale and, and understand how this could be funded by, by other means. Um, and in a way, you know, the Media Lab is a good example of this because a lot of what they do, I mean, they created the Creative Commons, you know, license, for example. And, um, and a lot of projects at Media Lab are, are, are open um, and they're being funded by some of the largest uh, corporations like, you know, Google, Amazon, Bose, you know, uh, and, and uh, the American Army and so on. Uh, but still they manage to produce uh, open hardware. I mean, that, that, you know, to a certain extent and their companies, as soon as their companies spin off from Media Lab, they're no longer open but you have a lot of open stuff that, that come out. And, and there's some open stuff also within uh, you know, big companies. Like you look at uh, Google, they, they do have some, uh, some open, uh, open, open source, but not, not so much in the, in the realm of hardware because, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, there, it's a real question. It's, and, and to me, it's a question of how do we convince investors that hardware is, is, is a proper solution? And, and I think it's 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 at this moment impossible, but it's 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 doable. Um, I think we have to really think about how we can demonstrate the because ultimately investors just they want to make money. So if um, if there's a way of showing that uh, it can be you know beneficial for the company, they they will be interested. So I think of, you know there are a number of questions. The first question would be who funds open hardware projects today, and what could convince those that don't that it could actually be a good idea. So Aniot is taking the ground. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for, uh, for your attention, everyone. And feel free to reach out uh, if you need uh, anything. Here's my email or my phone. You can contact me on WhatsApp.